Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace, a platform where you can design beautiful websites and host your online store. Alright guys, in today's video I'm going to teach you all about planning and shooting full moon rises or sets with a foreground subject. But you already know that because you've read the title of this video, so let's get straight into it. Woo! All right, let's talk about the location. So I'm always on the lookout when I'm driving or hiking for prominent buildings, trees, monuments, castles, something interesting that's in the distance and in the line of sight. And then once I've found one of those, I'll put it on my map. I use Google My Maps to record all of my locations, even use a little moon icon for all of my planned moon shots. And the further away your subject is, the smaller it appears to the moon. So it's when they're really far away, that's when you get the big impact of a giant moon against a small subject. And it helps when they're perched on top of a hill or a mountain or an island, and you can silhouette that subject against the moon. That'll have a much bigger impact. It also helps that I've got the freedom to move here all along the coast. So there's a lot of full moon rises that I can line up with this lighthouse because not every full moon rises in the same place. Some are more northeast, some are more southeast. But at least with a location like this, I've got the freedom to move along the coast and line up the shot perfectly with the moon. So bear that in mind as well when you found your subject to feature in your photographs. It's also worth doing like a little risk assessment of your location, like there's loads of cows <laughs> which are threatening to ruin my shot right now. But once you've got your location, it's time to plan and there are lots of good applications that can help you plan your apps pretty much, plan your apps, plan your shots pretty meticulously. I personally use photo pills, there's also photo the photographer's ephemeris and Planet Pro. Planet Pro has a really good virtual reality mode. But I like photo pills, I, I'm used to it, I can use it quite quickly, it's reliable, I've been using it for years so I know it works and I just really enjoy using it. So let me show you that quickly now. Okay so there are already very in-depth videos on the photo pills YouTube channel and website so I'm not going to go into much detail here, I'm just going to give you guys a quick overview as to how I planned this. So here you can see I've got the black pin on the lighthouse which is my target subject. And then if I zoom out, the red pin is where your camera is going to be. And then the light blue line, that's the position of the moon rise. So the moon is rising in the southeast. So I need to be standing somewhere towards the northeast of the lighthouse. So I'm going to take the red pin and put it over here somewhere. And I can also see that if I press the black pin, there's a, an altitude difference of 0.52 degrees. So if I want the moon to be behind the lighthouse silhouetted, I need to find a time when the moon, the elevation of the moon, which you can see here, when that's around 0.52 degrees. So I'm going to scrub forward in time, zoom in a little bit closer, and then the moon rises, and around about here is when it's 0.5 degrees. If I zoom in, It's close, but it's not the perfect alignment. Actually, okay, it's pretty good. So there we go. So there, the moon is like 0 0.6 degrees above the horizon. It's behind the lighthouse at this exact time. And that's where I'm going to take my shot. If this blue line wasn't behind the lighthouse, I would have moved my position of the red pin. Whoops. Of the red pin until it was sort of perfectly aligned. But if I zoom in again, you can also see the thickness of this blue line. That's how big the moon will appear compared to the lighthouse. So you can see that the moon is going to be much bigger than the lighthouse. All right, so let's talk about the gear that you need. So first of all, you need a camera. There's not much of significance. I mean, any camera will do a DSLR or a mirrorless, but one thing worth noting Crop sensors have an advantage over full-frame cameras when you're trying to make the moon big in the frame. Crop sensors have a 1.5, sometimes a 1.6 crop factor. So if I was to use a 400mm lens on my full-frame camera, I get a 400mm focal length. But if I use the same lens on my crop sensor camera, I get a 600mm focal length, and then the moon becomes bigger in the frame. And it's the same with Micro Four Thirds. If I use a 400mm lens with a Micro Four Thirds, I get an 800mm 
these cows are what? <laughs> surrounding me, get an 800 meter uh, image and so the moon will be bigger in the frame. But one thing to note is that the smaller sensors tend to have worse noise performance, so there's a bit more noise in the image, um, but it's normally a fair trade-off for having a bigger moon and that extra focal length. These guys are really curious about what I'm doing. Smile. Oh, they're all coming now. <laughs> oh God, I hope they don't ruin the shot. Not gonna lie, it's getting a little bit intense. <laughs> and there's a little one as well, so we gotta be careful. They're so curious. <laughs> Right, so whilst me of the past is being ushered out of a field by cows, allow me to talk to you about the sponsors of today's video, Squarespace. Now my website's been hosted on Squarespace for years now. I use it for galleries of my images, which look great because they don't get compressed like they do on social media. I also use it to sell my Astro Workflow Lightroom preset. It's amazing, everything is automated and easy. And another thing I love about Squarespace is the compatibility with like third-party plugins. So for example, I host all of my 360 degree panoramas on Memento 360, and I just copy and paste a little bit of code over to a page on my Squarespace website, and boom, you can see my 360 degree panoramas. If you would like a free trial of Squarespace, just go to squarespace.com forward slash Alan, and if you wanna go ahead and make a purchase for a domain or a website, use the code Alan and get 10% off your first purchase. Now back to the video. <laughs> oh my God, that was so intense. They basically just surrounded me. So I just grabbed all my tripods and just sort of calmly walked to the nearest gate or fence, which was like 500 meters, maybe more. And they were just surrounding me and jumping and, oh man. It was really difficult to stay calm because I knew if I run, it would all have gone <laughs> crazy. Oh, but they've finally sort of gone back in the field now and I've got this fence. But I was about to talk about the lenses, so... In order to make the moon big in the frame, you really need a long focal lens. So I'll put an image on screen now, which was taken with a 135 millimeter lens. You can see some frames there to see how much tighter it would be if you use a longer focal length, all the way down to sort of 600 mil. So you can really see that you need quite a long focal length to make the moon nice and big in the frame. So one of my personal recommendations, and those of you who have followed me on this channel for a while will know that I call this lens the Moon Bazooka. For obvious reasons, it looks like a bazooka and I only use it to photograph the moon. This is the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary lens. It's normally a lens that's used by sports photographers and wildlife photographers, but it's really good for photographing the moon. And it's a really affordable way to get 600 mil. Another thing is that if the moon is hiding behind some clouds and you need to zoom out, you have that ability to zoom out to 150, so it's a very versatile lens. Another lens that I use a lot is the uh, Sony 100-400mm. Um, it's much more portable than this lens, it's a little bit lighter, it fits in the bag a lot easier. And 400mm is normally pretty good and I crop in on my images. And you can also use teleconverters or extenders. So this is a two times, so when I put this on the 400 mil, it becomes a 200 to 800 millimeter lens. Image quality obviously does drop a little bit, but you're getting twice the focal lens, so it's, it's certainly worth it. And there are also 1.4 times teleconverters, which don't have as much uh, quality loss in the images, but obviously doesn't give you as much of an extension. It's only 1.4 times, so they're good. They give you that extra bit of, uh, extra bit of reach. Uh, but today I'm going to shoot with the 150 to 600 mil with a crop sensor Sony camera. So I'm shooting at 900 mil. And once you've decided on your camera and your lens, you're going to need a good solid base to shoot from a good solid tripod. Now I'm an ambassador for Benro tripods. I love their tripods. So I'm very biased in this opinion. I love Benro tripods. This is the Mark III. They also recently sent me the Tortoise, which I'm absolutely loving. It's even better than the... Uh, the Mark III, but some non-biased tripod advice that I can give you is spiked feet. So, I hope you can see that there. Put those on the, the bottom of the tripod, especially when you're on grass, and it really holds the tripod steady, because when you're working with such long focal lengths, you need the tripod as steady as possible, and these spiked feet on soft ground 
are amazing. And then another thing, I don't like using ball heads at this uh, crazy focal length. I much prefer to use a geared head. You can also use like a gimbal head. I'm not sure what they call them. They're used by wildlife photographers and sports photographers. Um, like a manual gimbal, I guess. But uh, I much prefer geared heads. You can make very minute adjustments in your composition. Normally I'd use the Benro three-way geared head, but recently I've been trying out this Sunway Photo. I don't know what the name is, but I'll put the name up on screen. Oh, the GH Pro 2, um, which is pretty good. It has its flaws, which I'll talk about at some point, or I'll just mention it in the comments down below. Um, one of the axes is a little bit loose, the tilt. The leveling axis gets a bit loose when you're perfectly level. It's kind of annoying, um, but otherwise it's pretty good. So that just allows me to make good minute adjustments in my composition, which is really useful when you're working with such crazy long focal lengths. <laughs> I'm going for it, last minute. I think the cows have gone. I'm hoping uh, they're getting ready for bed, but I couldn't see them, so I'm gonna go for it, man. Go about eight minutes. Whew. I hope I don't risk it. Uh, oh God, losing the shot. I'm gonna stay calm. All right, when it comes to settings, if your camera has a silent shooting mode, or um, you know, use live view to make sure that the, the shutter doesn't slap. That will reduce a little bit of the vibration in your camera. Don't press the shutter button. Use a remote shutter release or an intervalometer to fire your shutter. If you don't have one, use a five second delay on the shutter button. And when it comes to the settings, it varies depending on the situation. You wanna make sure that your shutter speed is quick enough so that you don't get any image blur Oh my God, this moon looks incredible. And so open your aperture and increase your ISO to make sure that your shutter speed is quick enough to make sure that the camera's not shaking if there's any wind. Um, you just wanna make sure that your shutter speed's quick enough. So at the moment, it's getting quite deep into twilight. I'm shooting at one over a hundred seconds. F6.3, that's my most, that's my widest aperture. And then ISO 1600, which is fairly reasonable. I can stack multiple images if I need to to reduce the noise in post production. Oh my god, it looks so good! Oh. That was pretty wild. What a day. I hope I managed to piece together a video. I'm a little bit gutted that I wanted to do a, a nice long time lapse of the moon rise as well as two different cameras with the 100 to 400, but the crazy last minute dash thanks to the cows. I'm just glad I got something. So the moon is looking absolutely spectacular still. And even though there's a lunar eclipse going on today, we can't see it in the UK. But this is testament that every full moon is just as stunning. That gorgeous crimson red colour as it rises, it's now turning orange, and then it'll go yellow and eventually white. And it just doesn't matter if there's an eclipse, a blood moon, a super moon, a micro moon, every full moon is incredibly beautiful. I don't think you'll tell the difference between them, so. Oh. Oh, it just feels so good to bag it because there's only 13 full moons in the year, so every full moon shot you get. <laughs> oh, it just does something to you, man. Oh. Absolutely gorgeous. 
Make sure to hit that like button if you learned something today. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.